How to Stop Freaking Out, The Ultimate Guide to Keeping Cool When Life Feels Chaotic, is a book for middle grade readers. It helps kids understand what causes them to melt down and offers advice on how to control their reactions. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner and welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Ahead, we'll explore the book and talk with the author. Carla Nomberg, PhD, is a clinical social worker, mother, and author of four parenting books. She joins us to talk about her new book for kids eight years and older, How to Stop Freaking Out, the ultimate guide to keeping cool when life feels chaotic. Carla, welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, there's so much in this book. We would talk about a few specifics, but Give us a brief overview. What are readers going to find here? Absolutely. This is a hilarious and fact-filled, practice-filled, insight-filled book for readers ages about 8 to 11 about how to stop freaking out. It's going to give them insights into what's going on that leads to their freakouts, skills and strategies for calming down instead of losing it, and then also a bunch of skills and strategies for what to do after you freak out, which still is going to happen from time to time. And one of the things you do in the book is you try to give kids a broad understanding of why they're reacting the way they are. And you talk about five different reasons that people freak out. Can you sort of walk us through that? Absolutely. Um, I think the why is really important for kids because I think for many people, it those moments feel so out of control that it can feel scary or confusing and lots of kids can blame themselves you know, they think there's something wrong with them. And so I'm really trying to humanize and normalize this experience. So the first reason is because nobody ever taught kids how not to freak out. I mean, Dan, did anybody ever talk to you about this when you were a kid? Because nobody talked to me about it. So we've never learned that. The second reason is that kids have a lot of practice freaking out. And what I always like to say is, We're always practicing something, whether or not it's anything we want to get better at. So if you're freaking out all day, you're practicing it a lot, and it's going to come really easily and naturally to you, whether or not you want it to. So that's reason number two. Reason number three is that, to tell the truth, sometimes freaking out feels kind of good. I mean, in the moment, often we feel out of control, and there's some sense we shouldn't be doing it, but we don't know what to do instead. But there can also really be a sense of sort of release and relief in finally getting that tension and stress out in a big way. Um, So sometimes freaking out can feel kind of good, even if it's not our most skillful strategy. Um, The next reason, number four, is that people in our lives may be freaking out a lot, whether it's a parent or a coach or a teacher or a tutor or an older sibling or a cousin. If people around you are freaking out a lot, you may start to see that as a reasonable response to difficult moments. And then the last, and I think this is the reason I sort of go into the most in the book, is that human brains are actually wired to freak out when our buttons are pushed. And it's a very normal part of the human experience and the way that our anatomy and our brains and our nervous systems are designed to function. And you explain to kids about how the brain works, which I want to talk to you about a little bit later, and also about buttons, why you have them, uh, and people are always going to push them and how you how you deal with that. As you mentioned, this book has a lot of humor in it. You have a lot of little things in there like truth bombs and uh, freak out facts and lots of quizzes. Tell us a little bit about those. Well, I don't like handing books to kids that have what I call the wall of words, which is where, you know, they open up the page and it just, for some kids, it can feel like a really impenetrable wall of just sentence, sentence, sentence. So my publisher, my illustrator and I, we all worked really hard to make this an engaging book. So we've got adorable illustrations and we've got quizzes. My daughters, I have two teenage daughters. And when I was working on this book, they said, mom, you have to put in the quizzes. Kids love the quizzes. Who doesn't love a good quiz, Dan? Um, And then we also have these truth bombs, which are these moments where I'm trying to really emphasize a point that I want the kid to really focus on. And then we've got these fun freak out facts. So let me give you a fact here. We all talk about having our buttons pushed, or at least that's something I hear a lot from my fellow parents. But the phrase pushing your buttons actually comes from the 1920s, when all of a sudden we had these magical appliances that could do things like wash your clothes and dishes and cook your food at the push of a button. But before that, 
that didn't exist. So all of a sudden we have this phrase where you push a button and something happens. Now, in that case, it was a great thing. But when our buttons are pushed, we lose it, which isn't always a great thing. One of the things you have fun with is acronyms in this book and yes. and also some comparisons with those acro- acronyms, including the word fart. And you say, you know, people fart. That's just natural. That's human. Uh, but that also plays into how you deal with not freaking out. So what does that acronym stand for? Yes. Yeah, so I do talk about farts in this book because if if we can't laugh about this stuff, we're just going to go nuts, right? So FART is an acronym that stands for the main features of a freakout. So the F is for feelings. Our, our freakouts are almost always powered by strong emotions, whether it's um, mostly an unpleasant or unwanted emotion. But I think any parent out there can relate to a kid who is like laughing so hard, they kind of tip over into crying, right? So strong emotions, F is for feelings. A and R for automatic and reactive. So our freakouts often feel like they happen, like, you know, a switch has been flipped. They, it's just instantaneous. And we are reacting to something, whether it's something that's happening right then and there in the moment or something that happened an hour ago that has been simmering under the surface. We're reacting to something. And then the T is for too much, which means that our freakout, our response is too much for the moment. Um, You know, it's okay to have strong feelings. That's normal. That's going to happen no matter what we do. It's okay to react to situations. The question is, is your reaction over the top and unwarranted for whatever's going on? So FART stands for feelings, automatic, reactive, and too much. I want to come back to the notion of buttons because you spend a long time talking with the kids about why they have buttons And uh, sometimes those buttons are perfectly reasonable (laughs) that uh, people push those buttons and sometimes those people are really irritating. And (laughs) you give plans for like, well, well, how can I maybe avoid that person or how can I find them less irritating? You just lots of ways that you cover that. But you also use another acronym that you've created called BURP, which is a button. I see if I'm going to look down here. Button reduction practices is what that's all about. So tell us a bit about buttons and how kids can learn to deal with that. I, I got to tell you, Dan, I'm particularly proud of this acronym. It took me a while, but I got there. Um, so the idea is that every human is covered with these invisible buttons. And when we are dealing with strong emotions, confusing thoughts, physical pain, exhaustion, grief, um, all of these different very human experiences, our buttons get bigger, brighter, and way more pushable right? And so we can't necessarily control what happens to us in life. We can't control what somebody else does. We can't control if somebody cancels plans. There are a lot of things out there we can't control, but what we can manage are our own buttons. And the idea behind burps, button reduction practices, is that there are choices we can make, practices we can do on a daily basis that are going to make our buttons smaller, dimmer, and more resistant to pushing. So if I'm in a terrible headspace at school because I didn't sleep the night before and I forgot to have breakfast and I'm all anxious about a quiz and I go to school and some kid looks at me funny, I might lose it. I might totally freak out at them, right? They, my buttons are so bright and pushable. All they had to do was look at me to push my button. But if I've slept well the night before and I spent some time hanging out with friends over the weekend and I had a good healthy meal and I listened to a song that totally cheers me up on the school bus and I've done all of these things, my buttons are going to be smaller and darker and harder to find. So maybe that kid, you know, they look at me funny and I don't even notice, or maybe they have to look at me funny 27 times over the course of the day before I lose it, right? So the goal here, and I give kids an an entire alphabet of strategies, an alphabet of burps, A to Z, that they can choose from. And what I want kids, and quite frankly, adults too, is to look through this list, find the strategies that seem doable and fun, and then start practicing them every day. Because the goal here is to keep our buttons small so that they don't get, they're not easily pushed. I'm talking with Carla Nomberg about how to stop freaking out. The Ultimate Guide to Keeping Cool When Life Feels Chaotic, and our conversation continues. If you're enjoying this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. The other thing I like about your book is is throughout, you point out that you're going to freak out. You know, you're not going to be perfect. Kids aren't expected to read this book and never have a problem again. So you reassure them that that's normal. 
So let's say your button gets pushed anyway, <laughs> even though you're trying to keep those buttons as small and unpushable as possible. Then what advice do you give kids for dealing with that? Yeah, so I have a three-step strategy for helping kids calm down or really anyone calm down after a freakout. It's called notice, breathe, and burp. And I tried to make it very simple. And the trick is just to remember to do it. But noticing, turning on this part of our brain that can be aware of literally anything around us is an incredibly powerful strategy for calming down. Um, often when we are in the midst of a freak out, we're not aware of what's going on. We're not aware of what, what's what's happening in our brains, how our bodies are behaving, how we're thinking, what we're saying. And so the point of noticing is to kind of take a moment to get outside this swirling moment of frustration and just look around, notice anything. So when my kids were really little, Dan, I would say to them, hey, what color is the couch? We'd be sitting on the couch. This is a really obvious noticing, but anything that takes you out of your own brain for a moment pulls on your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain right behind your forehead. That's the noticing part. That part can sort of, once we click that part on, that part of our brain, it can start to calm us down. So the first step is, I just want you to notice anything. You can notice the number of fingers on your hand. You can notice the sky above you. Anything you can notice to take you out of your own brain. The next step is to breathe. Just take a couple of breaths and be aware of them. And breathing can be such a cliche, telling someone to breathe, but it's a really powerful strategy. And the way I talk to kids about it is, it's like sending a text message directly to your nervous system saying, hey, you can calm down. So notice, breathe, and breathing will calm you down just a little bit more so that you can pick a burp and practice it. So my favorite burp when I'm like, I've just lost it and I need to calm down is I go outside. I'll just go onto my porch, onto my you know back deck, and just take some breaths and just standing outside in a different space is enough of a burp to really calm down my nervous system. And again, these burps, they don't have to be complicated or challenging. Like if you have a prayer or a mantra or a favorite song lyric, you can just recite that. If you want to turn on some music and jump around, if you want to go find your cat and pet them, like there's a million strategies, but notice, breathe, and burp is really your calm down, get out of this freak out headspace. And a moment ago, you mentioned the prefrontal cortex. And you, you explain that in the book. You also explain the limbic system so that kids understand why some situations, a different part of their brain will take over and try to protect them. I think you refer to that as kind of being like the safety squirrel <laughs> that helps them out. Yeah, I was going for an animal that I was pretty sure every kid had seen, no matter where you live. Look, our limbic system is this very... Um, reptilian, let's say, part of our brain that is there fully functioning the moment we're born and it's designed to keep us alive. Fundamentally, that's its goal. It makes sure we breathe. It takes care of all these sort of very automatic bodily functions that keep us alive. But also, it's the part that sends our body into fight or flight mode when something potentially dangerous is happening. And so I like to think about a safety squirrel because have you seen like watch a squirrel sometime they look a little bonkers they're sort of sprinting around and then they freeze and then they run off and if you watch them long enough you'll see them get into sort of territorial fights with other squirrels and our brains when we're freaking out can feel a little bit like that a little out of control a little crazy but really what it's trying to do is keep us alive and so these freakouts happen often when we feel unsafe overwhelmed and we don't know what else to do. And our brains go, this is a dangerous or scary situation. It's time to freak out. And it's not always dangerous or scary in a very physical way, but it can feel that way emotionally or socially. And you talk about how the, the prefrontal cortex, you know, mitigates that. You can tell the limbic system, no, no, it's okay. And we don't have to freak out in this situation. But you point out to kids that their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet. So it's not always going to work like they would want it to. In fact, uh, it might not fully develop until they're about 24 years old. Absolutely. So sometimes when kids are freaking out, if I'm having a hard time staying patient, Dan, I will look at them and just imagine sort of this blank, empty space behind their foreheads. That's not true. That's not scientifically accurate. But it helps me remember, oh, they don't yet have all the tools they need to stay calm in this moment. So our prefrontal cortex, I also think about it as the 
planning, figuring out, and calming down part of our brain, PFC. Another little acronym I just made up. It doesn't really encompass the entirety of what this part of our brain does. But it's growing and building and developing as our kids mature. And so often when they would otherwise need access to this part of their brain that says, hey, don't freak out because your peas are touching your pasta on your plate. Try saying that five times fast. Um, they don't have access to that part of our, their brain, whereas an adult ideally can look at that situation and not lose their temper over it. So what I also remind kids about is that your prefrontal cortex is actually kind of like a muscle in that it gets tired. It's not really a muscle. We don't have muscles in our brains, but it can get tired at the end of the day. So if you've had a whole day at school of planning, figuring out and trying to stay calm, whether it's about standing in line or understanding your math homework or, you know, stressing because you don't like your lunch, you get home at the end of the day and that part of your brain is toast. It's done. And that's why many parents often see their kids kind of flip out at the end of the day because they're just, they're exhausted. Now, there's so much more in this book we didn't have a chance to talk about. What would you say are some of the key insights that you hope kids are going to take from the book? Um, one of the really important insights is understanding the difference between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So we can't control our feelings. We can do things that might influence them. For example, imagining listening to a happy song versus a sad song or watching a funny cartoon versus a scary movie, right? We can do things that might influence our feelings, but there are also times when we have feelings that seem like they come out of nowhere. So what I say to kids is your feelings are never wrong. They might be unpleasant, but they're never wrong and you can't control them. You have to figure out strategies for sort of getting through the storm. Our thoughts are very similar. We can't control our thoughts. Uh, thoughts could pop into my brain. Doesn't mean they're true or false. I could sit here, Dan, and think I'm a unicorn all day long. It's not going to make it true, but I can notice my thoughts and choose to think something else. I might have to choose to think something else 87 times before it really clicks. The goal here is really about learning how to manage your behaviors the things you do that other people can see you do. So it's okay if you feel terrible. You're not doing anything wrong if you're feeling angry or scared or anxious or overwhelmed. The goal is knowing what to do with those feelings so that it doesn't turn into a freak out. The book is How to Stop Freaking Out, The Ultimate Guide to Keeping Cool When Life Feels Chaotic by Carla Nomberg. Carla, thank you for talking with me today. It was such a pleasure and thank you for having me. Now, if you'd like to purchase How to Stop Freaking Out, I've placed a link for you in the description below. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. Thank you for watching this edition of the Kids Bookshelf, and here are two more interviews you might find interesting. I'm Dan Skinner. Until next time, keep sharing the gift of reading.